next actor is um, Yi Ze. He goes by Frank. Uh, he is our own uh, made it uh, postdoc pro fellow here at Cornell. He's been here for two years. Almost two, yeah. yeah, almost two years. Uh, and he will leave to Peking University as an assistant professor coming January. Uh, he's going to tell us about uh, machine learning approaches for condensed matter physics and just about when you're kind of getting sleepy, if your you know, lunch is kind of working, he'll put up a demo. All right, let's welcome Frank. Well, thank you. Um, first, thank you, uh, Ola and Eric, for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to teach you some of the things I'm very excited right now about. So I'm going to talk about machine learning, which is a super hot topic right now. But we're not going to talk about how, why it is hot. It is hot because it's kind of useful. But we're going to get what machine learning approach, why it's so hot, the intuition behind it, and use it for our own methods, which is against better physics, and especially theoretical against better physics. So why a concept, which is applied to computer science, what the uh, impact for condensed matter physics? Well, um, in condensed matter physics, right now, we're ha facing some type of issues. The big data issue. So we're doing experiments and doing computing, computing simulations in an unprecedented way um, just 100 years ago. 100 years ago, when Rutherford applied this uh, gold field of uh, alpha <laughs> particle scattering, Experiment and there's only one detector and just move the hair around after the empty class. But the, the experimental setup we have right now, like let's say the <coughs> scattering and the experiment, have these so many detectors that we measure in real time in all kinds of angular resolution and integer resolution. We get a huge amount of data <coughs> from all of these different dimensions. So we have a big data. Issue. And it's because it's from our experiments. Well, it is a good thing that we have all this, these big data, but um, right now we are having this throttle bottleneck, and we cannot analyze these uh, huge terabytes of data um, from within a meaningful amount of time or hours. Another thing is that we're getting supercomputers simulating our quantum systems. And in, no matter in quantum of Carlo or DMRG or exact diagonalization, we're getting a lot of data. And eventually we're looking for maybe just one or two extracted numbers out of these simulations. And a huge amount of data are just thrown away. On the other hand, in condensed matter physics, there is a more intrinsic big data, big data issue. That's the many body degree to freedom. So there's a big data issue for the degree of freedom of a many body state. And we know the Hilbert space of a quantum body system is exponentially large. And um, even for classical body states, the total of degree freedom is just beyond our reach. So that is the complex reality. On the other hand, on the other hand, condensed matter physics is all about universality. So when we're talking about, okay, this is a superconductivity, or this is uh, um, an ordered state, we're always talking about simple concepts, simple principles. And these are Concept lying behind that, such as 
for the topological states, your topological index. And for a uh, symmetry breaking phase, there are a simple concept of all the parameter. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And uh, lying even deeper behind that, the physical reasons such as the Fermi statistics. Or symmetry breaking, etc., are relatively simple principles. So when we do science, what we want is that from this complex reality of data, we will try to summarize, to, to do a regression to toward these simple principles. or a classification. <laughs> okay, so we summarize these rules, which is rather simple, and then we want more. We want to use these uh, simple principles to do a generation, or do, to make predictions, which can be verified by future data, future experiments, or simulations. So we can so we want more than simple memorizing of the data or the compact truths. We want simple principles which have predicting power. So that's how we do science, and we have been quite successful about that. But until now, we are actually netted bogged down by the increasing complexity of data we have on hand. So that's the contrast that we have. And in order to do that, after computer was invented, it has really come to our aid. If for now, so let's say we have a bunch of data. We that we extracted from either experiments or simulations. And then what we can do is that we look at this data, we understand the underlying rules behind that, and now what we can do is that we can write computer programs. And what we do is that we use these computer programs to analyze the data we have in hand we set them into a computer. Computer will analyze these data and give us an output, which is, let's say, the complex index or the parameter, the simple, simple principles behind this complex data. This is especially useful for condensed matter physics because in condensed matter physics, what we are mostly interested in, let's say, is universality. For example, for a lattice model, there are so many degrees of freedom. But as condensed matter physics, physicists, what we're interested in is the long wavelengths, the low energy, collective excitation of the system. And we do not care or care as much about what happens at really, really high temperature. This in the picture of RG is just the saying that of all the degrees of freedom we have for this complex fundamental system, the very, only very, very few degrees of freedom are irrelevant. And the rest are irrelevant and becomes increasingly irrelevant as we go to longer and longer length scale so that we can forget about them when we talk about universality or what phase the, the fundamental system is up to. On the other hand, by doing this, we still need to cross the complexity bridge once. It is true that the computer can help us to do the generation job, but it's still up to our human intelligence, our heavy lifting, to summarize the regression out of the complexity of data 
in the beginning to start with. So the whole goal of all of this machine learning or artificial intelligence is to go one step further. And the not new way of actually we understand universality or understand all of these simple principles after complex data is to do machine learning. The algorithm is like this. Now we have a bunch of data. And we know the supposed outcome of according to this data. So these are called the training set. We fed these data and output into the computer. The computer will write a program for us. Okay, so that's step number one, the regression part. And once that's complete, if we now have some additional data, we send into the program and the computer directly tells us the output corresponding to the new inputs. And these new inputs are not simple reproduction of the old training set. It has it has generation, uh, it is more general. It has uh, predicting power, and it really understands the general rule behind all of this data. It's actually just memorized. And that's a new way of programming. So when this is the traditional programming, this new way of programming is what has been dubbed as machine learning. Okay, so why is this? Uh, it looks like this is a very complicated uh, thing that uh, I'm advertising here. But the true fact is that we have already been doing this thing in our daily research lab. One example when we are doing this, is when you're doing a linear regression. A linear regression is when, let's say, you have a simple function. You have data reflecting um, some connection between the input x and output y. So let's say you have something like this. OK, so that's your data. And what we all know how to do is that we show a computer program, and we do a linear fit. And when this happens, the computer gives us a linear regression. A function, which is y equals ax plus b, that gives us the least square fit to all of these data we have. Once this is done, let now let's say we do a future experiment. And let's say the output, uh, the input is x. And this linear regression has a predicting power to tell you the expected output with the corresponding uncertainty. So this is the simplest way of machine learning. And we have been doing that for daily labs. But as we'll soon find out, that linear regression is way not enough. In our daily lives, many decision making and many tasks can be regarded as something as similar as this, just more complicated. For example, uh, when you take your phone, your phone is doing the image recognition, the input will be the RGB pixel by pixel input, and output will be what the figure is about, whether it's about a building or a car or your what. And another maybe more famous um, kind of um, 
application, the alpha code, is just by inputting the location of the stones, the black and white stones, and output will be the likelihood of winning the game. Or self-driving car. Self -driving, for self-driving car, the input will be, let's say, the location of their surroundings, their movement speed, etc., etc. Output will be that your actions to be taken in the near future. So these are all functions. You have a bunch of outputs, and you have a bunch of inputs, and you have a rule for processing this input so that you get the desired outputs you want. But for more complicated case, such as the image recommendation for Go and some driving cars, especially in kinetic physics, we'll soon be running out of wits if we stick with linear functions. The reason it behind linear function that linear function is insufficient is because of correlation. When correlation becomes important, we have to consider processing the inputs using a correlated manner, non linear which is fundamentally nonlinear. And such linear functions will be insufficient for this for describing our jobs. I mean, do you have a question? Can you also program what the relevant axis should be, or can can it describe what variables are important? Next, you but, have to a priori know what the important variables are, or is there a way of discovering? That's a that's a very good question. So um, in this case, I'm just assuming one yeah. input, one output, and if your computer is smart enough, and even if you have multiple inputs. And it will identify the, the right correlation, so which are the relevant inputs, which are the relevant, uh, just by doing a similar kind of linear fit. Just like when you're doing a similar linear fit, but in higher uh, dimension, and uh, you will find, okay, so the output is linearly dependent on some, some indexes, but not on others. And, uh, okay, so the, the Doing, let's say, one sample of jobs, like let's say, we, if we are actually given a many body point state, and we want to know what point of phase this is corresponding to, this task is actually fundamentally very similar to image recognition. So you handle something with all kinds of details, like let's say your car, your cats, or somebody else's uh, building, etc. These have all of information, but none, not all of them are relevant. We only care about the questions we're asking. What is the subject? It can be a car taken from the front, uh, photo, photo from the front or from the side. And we're only caring about universality, which is like, what's the long wave lens physics behind the point of the state? We don't care what was the color of the car. We don't care what's beside the car and how far the car is. These are like, the higher energy, shorter distance, irrelevant details corresponding to our to corresponding our kinetic physics. So we want to devise this kind of functionality so that once we input all the degrees of freedom, the output will be what we design. Let's say the phase where it's corresponding to, and or what's the topology index. Like, like I just showed you, a linear function is not good enough. So how do we treat this problem? I mean, our humans are curious things, and we realize like, uh, um, our brains are just made up of, of a bunch of neurons. So even like uh, decades ago, people have been devising these uh, artificial neural networks and to uh, study the expressibility and uh, functions of those. So that will be our main topic. There are further, there are many, many more ways of doing machine learning, but artificial neural networks is probably what you have heard the most, and that's for a reason, because of its simplest, simplicity.
So you probably have seen some of these uh, figures. And that's, our, that's an artificial neural network. So let's take one neuron out and take a look at this. So for each neuron, and we know, let's say, the neuron of our neural system, um, it has a, a bunch of inputs attached to it that comes out from the other neurons. And then it will be able to send outputs to other neurons it is attached to. So um, the electric signals coming from the other neurons, we can parameterize as, as x1, x2, and x3. The neuron, each neurons are in, is, independent, is independently programmed. So that it will assess the input, all of the inputs that's in, in, that, that, that it takes. So W times And then it will make a decision and make an output to all the neurons it's connected to. Say the output, according to you, it gives to the subsequent neurons will be sigma times B. Biological neurons. How does it work? The biological neuron only has two states: firing or not firing. So if the neuron gets enough external excitation, it will decide to fire, and the corresponding electric signal will be passed to the subsequent neurons. Then the sigma function, or what we call an activation function, will be. That function, okay. So, um, it's the sine of z plus one divided by two. So it's one if z is larger than 0, and 0 otherwise. Uh, this kind of function works, and it's one thing that's special about it is that it's not a linear function. But it's not so easy to optimize because um, it doesn't have get a good derivative. And computer engineers have found other nonlinear functions to work in replacement of it. One of the functions is called a sigmoid function. Which will look like this when so sigmoid is 1 when z goes to positive infinity, and 0 when z goes to negative infinity. The third choice is called rectifying linear units. So the output will be 0 if for z is smaller than z is 0, and z for otherwise. Okay, so that's about one neuron. And now, by connecting all of these neurons, associating their inputs to uh, uh, output to other neurons, we build an artificial neural network. That's a step number one. Step number two 
is to make sure that these kind of neurons are, are, uh, can be trained and can be optimized. So there's one special geometry about these neurons. Yes. You wrote functions of one input variable, and you have several input variables. What do you do? Yes. So the um, when you have several inputs, the neural will have an internal wave of S S S in these inputs. So the inputs are S S S by a bunch of parameters W that we call weights, and with a constant associated with that neural B, which is now called the bias. It sum up all of the inputs with their respective weights, and that's how they implement the overall inputs that they receive. Once you have that, the neuron will decide whether it's past the threshold or not, and give the not corresponding output. OK. So we have a neural network, but it cannot be arbitrary neural network, because the, the actual neural network, the study of that, can be as complex, or even more complex, than condensed matter. Um, it's an unsolvable problem, but there are several sim simplifications we can make to make the optimization possible. One way is to design the neural network as a special geometry, as I would have shown you right here. If you look at this special neural network, and it has a layered layer structure, it has three layers, and each layer um, has connection to all of the neurons in the next layer. So this type of special geometry is called a feed-forward neural network. So the leftmost layer is the input. It is like our eyes, our ears, it takes input information. And information is then passed on to the deeper layers. The internal layers are called the hidden layers. The hidden layers are like our, uh, our brain. It processes the input information in a sequential way. And once this process is, in, is processed, all information, uh, uh, sorry, all the information is passed to the output layer, which acts as, uh, as our hand or our mouth. It gives the output to take the respective uh, action. So this is a, an artificial neural network. And the, the good thing about this kind of neural network is that its expressibility is very general. So mathematically, if you have even one hidden layer with nonlinear functions, and you can represent any functions, not any function you want given the input, uh, if you, for a finite but sufficient amount of uh, hidden layers in the hidden neuron. So the expressibility is very, very good for this kind of structure. The second good thing about this type of uh, structure, neural network structure, is about the, the way we can optimize it. Yes. So the result is that like the bound on the resources in the network though is exponential, right? So it's saying like you can you can express any function given that you have exponentially like many many resources or whatever. So it's a it's kind of a weak bound. So. It's it in is practice. true. Yeah. It's, it's, so for some, uh, it is possible that you will need an exponential amount of neurons in the hidden layer, and one way of doing that is instead of going wide. We have more neurons in the hidden layer. We can go deep. We can have more hidden neurons, uh, hidden layers connect to each other. And uh, deep, deeper, that's actually one, one very um, hot topic recently that's called deep learning. Deep learning is nothing but a, a, a neural network that has uh, multiple, actually many, many um, hidden neurons. So going deep is one way of actually adding up to the complexity of the function that, um, of the function that artificial neural network can do. At the cost, there's a cost. The cost is that the deep layers are much more difficult to train. Okay, so there is a balance. The balance is uh, that... Um, Perhaps you can mention why it's easier to go deep and have more neurons than having a wider single hidden layer? Yeah, so... Um,
Um, you can, we can look at one simple example and look at that will explain why deep neural, net, deep neural networks are actually more expressive. So for example, the, all these neural networks can be um, very useful in our daily like, decision making. Like, um, our input is a bunch of parameters, let's say, uh, whether we're going to next year's March meeting or not, and different conditions, like we're giving a night talk or not, and we're, um, we have friends going, we have time for going, we're too busy or not, we have a conflict in schedule. These are the inputs. And then what we do is that, uh, okay, so we have, these inputs goes into the hidden layer, and the hidden layers can process these in the, uh, informations independently. So let's say the first uh, hidden neural is that, uh, okay, you have excuses for not going. Uh, so it will, um, it will see, okay, so we have a complex schedule, so this neural is more likely to be activated. But if you have invited talk, or if your advisor is pushing you to go because they're not going to, then probably the, the the, the liability neural will be lined up. Okay, so, and then, let's say there are further neurons, and the deeper neural network you have, the more complex kind of logic function that you can, you can kind of represent. For example, um, if you have, if, if this is for image recognition of, to recognize whether you have a car or not, and um, if this neuron decides there is a wheel and there's another, another neuron saying there is some kind of glass in the shape of a windshell. And these, these two can go to and activate, go to activate the neuron, which says this is a car. But if only one of them is activated, then that's probably not a car, but a bike. So the deeper layer you have, the more expressibility you can have. But uh, because there, uh, there's uh, uh, more parameters of social neural network, and especially for the training the neural network, we will be talking about the gradient descent later, the gradient descent later, and there will be a critical slowing down. So um, the training the neural network with more depth is going to definitely going to be harder. Yes, Paul. Uh, um, actually, uh, an infinite, width, uh, large enough width, single layer is just as expressible as a deep network. Yes, it, large enough. A large enough single layer is just as expressible. The reason everybody goes to deep layers is because of GPUs. They're good at doing those matrix computations. Very good. Thank you for bringing this up. So this kind of uh, uh, neural network has been devised even back into the 1980s or 1990s. The reason why it only becomes more accepted as a way of machine learning is because of the um, introduction of GPU computing. So our GPU um, can be, so it's very different from CPU. Our CPU has very limited number of processors, and, uh, but it has more general power of doing the computation. The GPU is simpler, but it has much more processors in the core. Because the, the task of GPU is that it needs to tell the monitor, each, each pixel of the monitor, what colors are going to show. So it's a simpler task. But it's a similar task that needs to be done many, many times. So it has many micro like GPU processing units. And the, the job of neural network is very similar to that. Each neuron is doing a very simple job. It's the, it's the, the, the connectivity and the, 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 the collective power of that that gives you all of this process, uh, all of that uh, complexity that we need in treating the large big data. So we know that, uh, yes, the neural network can have very good expressibility. Of course, this, uh, expre we have to balance between this uh, expressive, except express, expression power between how we optimize it. In other words, uh, when you go, you decide not to go to the March meeting, 
and uh, you miss out important talks or your advisors um, kind of uh, didn't give you an easy day and you feel this, you feel regret about your decision. So what you will do is that you are going to revise your decision making. So what you will do is that you will read and adjust all of these weights and biases and then use some beats. So that is more likely to succeed next time. That's how we learn. We all start as a noob that know nothing about physics. It's just like the teacher teach us, we read papers and we know how things are doing. We learn by examples. And uh, by reading many more papers and doing more examples, we readjust the ways uh, so that giving the input, the output will be as close to the idea result as possible. Just like linear, linear regression. When we do linear regression with the, 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 co we need, with the cost function, the, there's a cost. The cost can be regarded as the, the, square, the, the square of the error. And we want to minimize, we really just the parameter of uh, the fitting, which is A and the, sorry, the slope A and intercept B, so that the, the square is as small as possible. Like here, here we can divide something which also tells you how good the fitting is. Let's say we have an input. Now I have a neural, neural, neural network, is something like uh, the function. The output y, given the input x, which into the input, neuron, uh, input neurons, like our eyes, the output is y. And then we can define something like the cost function. OK, think about this. The cost function is given all of your samples For each sample, the output P I Okay, so if we define a function like this, where P is a supposed output of your neural network, saying, okay, so the, the third, well, first neuron should be lit, or an other neuron should be um, zero, the first neuron will be one, while Y is neural output, And this will be zero if the answer is perfectly correct. And otherwise, it will be the positive definite number. The reason, so what we'll do is that we'll try to minimize this cost function. And we'll do it iteratively so that this function will, bother, will, will be as, as small as possible. That's how we can optimize the neural network. So we know this has been very good express, expressed in power. Now what we want to do is that we do want to do the fit. We want to fit to the, out, the, the input so that the output will be as close to our desired result as possible. And so we define this uh, cost function and we want to uh, iteratively lower the cost function so we can, uh, uh, we can perform this, uh, we can perform, we can, we can get our, uh, neural network to perform our functionality. This is the exact process of machine learning. So how to do that? Well, you, as physicists, you might have already guessed it. We just take a gradient descent.
In other words, that's a, if that's the fault, if I cost function, and I, if I want to do as an update to the parameter of the neural network, which is the weights and biases, and make sure that the cost function is will be decreasing, the best way to do is to take a gradient of the cost function with respect to all of the parameters that makes up the neural network. So what we'll do is that we will calculate the gradient of the cost function with respect to the weights on the case layer connecting the i and j neurons, i j neurons of k minus one layer and j layer of the case layer. We also calculate the derivative with respect to the bias. And then if we take a small step, lambda, which is step size, we let our new weight and new bias to be adjusted along the gradient direction. This is going to make sure that for each step of uh, optimization, our cost function is going to be smaller. As simple as that. Although there's going to be a, a few approximations that's going to help us, the first thing is why will become obvious why the feedforward neural network is going to help us. The feedforward neural network is there so that the gradient of the cost function with respect to all the weights and biases can be calculated in a much simpler fashion. That's called the, <coughs> the train law of the gradient. So what we will typically do is that uh, we have our training sets, we input the training sets, and we can calculate the, the output, and we can take, we can get a brief, uh, brief idea how well it's doing, and then we can take the of, of of the cost function with, with respect to the change of the weights and biases in, in the outer mode layer, and use the training law of the derivative, just go layer by layer back to get the derivative in the in the layers on the left. This kind of feedforward neural network um, can, can be updated in this fashion. In, that's very easily implemented by this algorithm, which is more commonly known as back propagation. So back propagation help us to very efficiently calculate the gradients of the cost function with respect to all of the parameters of the neural network. And that's one of the main reasons why we choose this type of geometry and architecture to start with. The second thing we do is that we do a stochastic deep gradient descent. These are commonly known common words in the, the book of machine learning. So if you're interested in implementing some of these ideas, there is a very good reference by Michael Nielsen. It's an online book called Deep Learning and the Neural Networks. So um, once we have the gradients, the, uh, and we can do a gradient descent. So what is stochastic about it is that uh, uh, in order to calculate the real gradient, we need to start over i, which is all the samples we have in the training set, which is um, a lot of data. 
So the stochastic gradient descent is just to limit this summation i in for each gradient descent step to a much smaller batch. So let's say we have 10,000 uh, different uh, samples. Let's choose 50 out of them. And let's say, let's calculate the cost function defined with respect to these 50 samples. These 50 samples are randomly selected. And we can take these 50 samples, calculate the gradient, and do one gradient step along the gradient. The hope is that uh, this is going in the right direction of the true gradient, and this actually can really perform if we do this great uh, uh, stochastic descent, gradient descent, many, many steps, because uh, the, the, eventually all of the samples is going to be, uh, is going to come over. So uh, uh, that's, that's stochastic gradient descent. Once we have that, and uh, the third step is that um, we, will, we will get very good results. We, we can minimize the, the cost function, and we get a very, very good output, just similar to the inputs. But there's one thing that I have to, that we have to be cautious, which is avoid overtraining. And I believe you have already noticed that why neural network has so much expressive power. It's because we have so many different parameters in the neural network. And by increasing the number of parameters, the danger is always overfit. Because uh, some common word is like, uh, give me, if you give me four parameters, I can fit uh, an elephant. And if you give me so many neural networks, I can just fit anything. But if you by overfit, the neural network will lose generalization power. It will be only memorizing the samples we have. It's like when you're teaching a course uh, or a student is learning a textbook. One common mistake is that student would just pretend to memorize all the examples in the textbook. And when it comes to a, a, a final exam and the, the teacher just hand over a completely different problem using the same logic, a student will completely miss the point because he didn't understand the underlying general logic behind the examples, except just memorizing them. In terms of uh, linear regression, let's say if, we, if I have these, let's say these points, and the, the logic behind the correlation between s y is more likely to be a linear function because uh, fitness is ten should be simple and beautiful. But if you are giving more degree freedom, let's say seven parameters, then I can fit with much better fit. It's actually perfect fit. With seven parameters, I can solve this uh, uh, power law exactly. So there's no fitting error whatsoever. But this kind of curve is less likely to be the scenario behind this, behind all of this data. Because uh, there's, that's going to be overfitting. One way of avoiding overfitting is that say, okay, so I didn't start with seven, seven points. I actually started with nine points, let's say. But I'm hitting. I'm hitting two points so that I'm not fitting, I'm, I'm fitting uh, this, uh, all of this data without knowing these two points. And after fitting, I compare whether these two points are logical of this, uh, on this fit. And if, if the results of, the, of these, uh, these uh, uh, additional data, which is never used in the training, turns out to be positive, it is more likely that the fitting is actually giving me the general, you know, generalizable group. Otherwise, if it overfits, then it will fail on these unseen examples because it's just memorizing the old data. And when it ever sees the new data, it doesn't know what to do. Like giving a, when you're giving a test, you're not going to give what you've caught in the classroom, but uh, some slightly modified reserve 
um, problems in your stock room to make sure that they are not only good memorizers of what you have been teaching, but they are actually taking initiative in understanding the underlying rules. So that's avoiding overfitting. The way of avoiding overfitting can be taken uh, is first of all we need regularization. In other words, we are going to make our neural network to have not perfect memory. So this can be done uh, just by simply forbidding the ways of going to be too large. Because uh, in this example, in, if you fit a power law to these seven points, and it's the way the, the parameters, sorry, the, the coefficients of the power law is going to be extremely large. So what we can do is that uh, for each step, we're going to slightly reduce the magnitude of the weights associated with the neural network, so that there's going to be a balance between training and forgetting what you have learned. This kind of forgiveness is actually a good thing to avoid overfitting. The second thing we will apply is to make sure that there's going to be uh, let's say some percent of the, of the training set that's being reserved and never used in the training process and that's called a validation <coughs> set. So what we so what we do is that um, uh, we do this as a test and gradient descent to optimize neural weights and biases, and for each cycle of uh, all all of the training sets, we'll include regularization to, to avoid overfitting. But eventually, we'll try to in each cycle we'll see, try to uh, evaluate the performance of our artificial neural network just trained on a reserve validation set, which is, has never appeared in the actual training processes. That tells us how good the training is, and we're at the risk of overtraining our neural network. Okay, so this is the simple way of machine learning um, with artificial neural network. And uh, so what I will, can, will show you right now is a simple example. Okay, so here is the example. What, what I'm doing is that um, um, that's an example code. I'll, I'll, I'll do some synthetic data. The data I do is a two-dimensional data. It's in the XY plane. And uh, the data is uh, characterized, uh, characterized by three different classes following certain rule. Okay, so I'm going to generate this data randomly. And here's the data I we generate. So it's random. And the data um, um, have three different classes. And I'm hiding the underlying rule um, how these three data are, are synthesized. So these three data are not linearly separable. In other words, if we were trying to fit these three data, uh, data sets with a linear kind of rule, let's say, um, 
I have two parameters, x and y. Let's say the for the first category, and then the, the <coughs> its weight or its output is uh, linearly dependent on x, on x and y, and say for a second and third category, then the boundary for the phase diagram will always be linear. So we can do such a we can do such a linear fit to see whether it can fix the phase diagram and whether it performs well. Okay, here's the result. So it's fitting right now. And you can see that, uh, okay, so what I'm doing is I'm fitting three functions, linear functions, depending on x, y, so that the result will be as close to the, the, the data point I have as possible. But it's never getting close. So you see that this is already kind of good. The, the, the red region is trying to maximize its overlap with all of these uh, known data points, but it's missing a lar large number of data points outside. All of the boundary has to be linear. That's as consequence of linear fitting, linear function. It's limited. And after, let's say, um, so many fits, it's better than guessing. So if you have three categories, and you're guessing, OK, class one to three, completely randomly, you're going to be cracked 33.33% of the time. <laughs> um, this is slightly better than that. This, you're getting 37% of the time right. But uh, I mean, science should be more accurate than that. So let's try an, an artificial neural network. Um, so this is an artificial neural network. So we're going to have an artificial neural network with just one hidden layer, some initially, um, up, some initially randomly initialized weights and biases, and just 100 then, neurons in the hidden layer. It's a very simple neural network, some of the simplest you can get. We're going to optimize, so the step size is a lambda. It's uh, for each step, we're going along, we're going along the gradient e step of the cost function. Oh, thank you. We're going to um, do gradient e step along this, uh, the cost function with that kind of much of amplitude. Regularization is exactly the kind of uh, um, <laughs> eta that I just showed you to make sure that uh, regularization is there and we're not overfitting the data. Okay, so, and then what we're doing is that uh, we're going to put input the data, and then we're going to calculate the gradient descent, the gradient descent. So we're going to calculate the, um, we're going to the derivative of, of all, the, all the parameters, the, the, and the cost the function with respect to all of the, the, the parameters, and then we're going to do one gradient descent, and then we're going to iterate this process many, many times. Okay, and now I'm going to show you, um, let's see how it behaves. Okay, so here's the result. So initially it's not really doing very well, but uh, you see after 35 thousand iterations, it's slowly getting to recognize this spiral kind of constraint. So we, right now, we only have two inputs and three output neurons. So this is a simple problem, but we already see that um, um, this input-output is already behaving, I mean, unscalable number of times better than a linear function fit. So we get 99% accurate. And this kind of feature can, uh, idea can be generalized to even more complex functions. And, uh, for example, you can you can you can arbitrarily as as long as there is some proof that we can attack, we can um, can discern. Then, given enough enough number of time, there's a lot of there, there there's a little bit of tuning in the training speed or regularization that um, take a little bit of experience to get used to. Uh, given the number of uh, enough enough num amount of training, we we'll see that uh, well, not this kind of uh, um, artificial neural network with uh, hidden layers, 
simple accumulators, not that many of neurons, nonlinear activation function. So the, here we use the rectifier linear units, which is kind of linear, but um, it already performs a nonlinear, our, our purpose of being, having nonlinear hierarchy. And it can fit uh, really, really well to the underlying root, roots behind all these spiral diagrams over, over the other. So this is a simple illustration. And this is already a very good step forward for our two, two, um, two parameter fit. We only have two inputs. Imagine for our antibody system or have some experiments, some simple simulation, where we have tens or hundreds of thousands inputs, and we're trying to get an output. And we're going to, well, linear fit is not going to be always helpful. But neural networks, we're going to do all of this regression, this heavy lifting to computers, and we're going to get a product, the neural network, so that it's after regression, it gets this uh, simple rule, simple principle behind all of this data. We can apply it to something we didn't have not encountered before, something we want to test with. And more importantly, as I will, if, if I have enough time, I'll show you later, will we even be able to extract the simple principle out of this function, out of this function, so that we will be able to write down the expression of the characterization or the classification of these artificial neural networks. And we'll be able to not only train this neural network, but also interpret how it understands the physics the physics behind all this data. So uh, that will be, I will be telling you more about application of all of these uh, um, machine learning approach and techniques on Thursday morning. And thank you for your attention. Question, question, question. Yes? How many neurons, how many hidden layers? For this one? Mm -hmm. uh, so this one is a, a, a shallow artificial neural network with just one hidden layer and the 100 um, Neurons within the hidden layer, and uh, uh, this this kind of neural network, I can guarantee you, was was the right algorithm, with like uh, like uh, stochastic gradient descent, and especially the back propagation algorithm can be easily perform on your laptop. If you have a uh, a, a laptop from the last decade, you, can, you will be able to perform this <laughs> And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for your attention. Are you going to make this notebook available to us? Um, I mean, this this is the yeah this is the I'll, I'll I'll put it on on the, on the website. Okay. For sure. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're a little bit over time. We'll take a couple of questions before we go out for public break questions. Yes. Uh, how many? Like, what's the size of the training data set on this? Oh, OK. So I think I didn't mention it. Um, so for this case, I generated this random data set with uh, 200. With 200 data. But there's like, for, what is it, like 600 or something parameters in your network, right? There are, there are 100 uh, neurons in the hidden layer. Yeah, so the weights are like. What is it like two but two times a hundred? Two hundred and then yes, three times the, hundred. Okay, so there's five. Right. For for that, Plus for the weight three. between these two layers, there's going to be parameters that's uh, um, eight hundred because it's two hundred per class. So I have eight hundred inputs. Sorry, eight hundred uh, samples and one hundred layers. So that's already that's already eighty thousand parameters. So eight, sorry, um, no, no, so two, two inputs, two inputs, and uh, uh, and 100, oh, sorry, two inputs and 100 thin layers, so that will be two times uh, uh, 200, 200. 200 and then 300 plus the biases, so that's like 600. Yes. So there's about 600 parameters. So, if there's 600 parameters and 200 data points, uh -huh. why? So, do you have a feeling for at, at what number of parameters in the model would we start to see in the picture like a bad overfitting? Um, 
because it's already, we would kind of naively expect overfitting in this case already, because there's more parameter, there's much more parameters than data points, right? Yes. But we don't see it in the picture, so why? Um, okay, that's a very good question. So the reason before, behind why this fit overfitting is not becoming so serious is because uh, we have an underlying rule behind this data. So these data are not so wildly dispersed around this uh, the center. So what we do is that we, we, we write the underlying rule, which is spiral, and then we add a, some kind of random dispersion around this spiral kind of rule so that the data follows, directly follow this rule. Therefore, we'll, we have something that we can, the neural network can converge to without overfitting the data. You're trying to say the data is structured? The data, the data is, you are trying to classify has underlying structure. Yeah, if you have an underlying rule or under, or underlying structure behind that, overfitting like here, um, if, if I queue up this random parameter a lot more so that uh, it's more, becoming much more um, random patch, that overfitting will become an issue. Yeah. All right. You can try that out once the loop is out. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to put all of these and uh, uh, you can change these parameters to see or the rules, whether it's spiral or whatever, how, what's the rule behind these data points that scatter and see whether the neural network as well as the linear classifier will be able to separate these uh, classifications. All right, um, any other burning question from the same group? <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say maybe uh, a different way to ask the question is to what extent like, something like regularization can offset overfitting. Because you have, reg you have some regularization here, right? Yes. Well, um, unfortunately, that's, um, there's no definite answer to this. Um, regularization is important, but um, um, without which you're bound to have some sort of overfitting. But how large of your regularization is going to be sufficient, or whether it's uh, over regularized, is mostly experience, I would say. Try and, uh, try, and uh, try to hit or miss. And you'll see if it's too big, then, you, then training accuracy will not be as great. And uh, if it's not there, then validation will just blow up. Paul, you have a question? I just, yeah, I'm just going to make the same point. You can quantify it by holding out data and you know, seeing the bias variance trigger. Yeah. All right. Um, if there aren't any more burning questions, um, let's thank Frank again. and.